Thank you, Anton and worship team, for leading us this morning. Well, a couple of years ago now, uh, one of my sons and I took a kind of bucket list trip to the Great West, to uh, Arizona. Now, we had both already seen the Grand Canyon, but we had a couple other things on uh, our list we wanted to visit. And top of that list was an area called Monument Valley, uh, which is an area of spectacular rock formations uh, at the border of Utah and Arizona. How many have been to this part of the country? It's amazing. In fact, you could like take Chicago out there and hide it in Monument Valley, just vast spaces of beauty. Uh, you might recognize uh, this road. Uh, this is the road leading to Monument Valley, and those rock formations you see in the distance are 12 miles from the place where, you, where the photographer is standing. It's just a straight shot, 12 miles. In fact, this is the road made famous by the movie Forrest Gump uh, when he stopped running right there. Um, I was trying to think about who he reminds me of there, but I really couldn't think of anyone. Maybe, maybe Pastor Sterling after a really bad <laughs> hair day. I don't know. <laughs> I won't, you won't be able to get that out of your mind now. Sorry, Sterling. Um, so we took in the view and took photos and all that and headed back to our hotel. But after dinner, uh, after night fell, it was a clear night, so we decided to go back out to that spot on the road. Uh, and we had a clear night, and so we just went out and laid down in the middle of the road. It was like midnight, and my son took his camera, pointed up at the sky, and he took this picture. That's the Milky Way. And we just laid there looking up and tried to soak in the wonder and the awe and the, the hugeness of the universe we were looking at. Now, my guess is most of you in, in this room or watching have had a similar experience. Uh, you've seen Niagara Falls, or you've seen, looked out over the Grand Canyon, or maybe Monument Valley, or somewhere, and you have that overwhelming experience of awe. And you've, you have two simultaneous reactions, I think. One is you feel very, very small in the face of something so vast. And at the same time, you feel a kind of awe and wonder at something or someone so overwhelming that can only be called glory. It's glorious. Today we wrap up our series from the book of Psalms that we've called Questioning God. And as we've gone through these Psalms, we've looked at a bunch of questions, um, like where are you, God, in the face of all the injustice we see around us in the world? Or what is the meaning of my life? Does my life have any meaning when my life is so short or even maybe when I fail? How do I deal with spiritual depression or loneliness? My soul is downcast. Last week, how do I overcome my fears and my anxieties? Today we look at Psalm 24, and the question we're gonna look at is who is the king of glory? Who is worthy to approach the king of glory? Or who is God, and how do we respond to him? Now Psalm 24, you need to know, is the third of a trilogy of what are called messianic psalms. Psalm 22 uh, tells us the Messiah is the one who will suffer. And that's the psalm Jesus quoted from the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 23 tells us the Messiah will be the shepherd. That psalm begins with the famous words, the Lord is my shepherd. Now Psalm 24 tells us the Messiah is and will be the king of glory. Now each one of these psalms, uh, because they're messianic psalms looking toward the Messiah, point us toward the eventual coming of Jesus. But this psalm has likely a special occasion, a specific occasion. It was to be sung as the Ark of the Covenant, I'll explain that in a moment, was being carried through the gates of Jerusalem uh, to the tabernacle, to the central and most holy place of worship. So it's a psalm of great celebration. Little background, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, made famous by the Indiana Jones movie, but the Ark of the Covenant was the holiest possession of the people of Israel. It was a gold-plated wooden chest that contained the tablets, the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments and a few other items, and it was uh, the symbol of the very presence and power of God himself. Therefore, God, throughout the Old Testament, had given some specific instructions as to how the Ark of the Covenant was be, to be handled because it represented his holiness. For example, it was never to be touched by human hands. It was to be carried only through poles, slipped through golden rings, and it was only to be carried by people called the Levites, because they had been specifically trained for the holy task of carrying the ark. 
But when David, we see this back in the Old Testament, rescued the ark from the Philistines who had captured it in war, he put it on an ox, ox cart, and when one of the oxen stumbled, a man named Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark and touched it. And he died on the spot. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Now, beyond the immediate purpose of celebrating the glory of God, this psalm was also prophetic. Remember I said it's a messianic psalm. It points ahead to the coming of the Messiah, to the coming of Jesus Christ. So let's read Psalm 24 as we get started. Your Bible will say a Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's. I will stop you right there. Whenever in your Bible you see that the word Lord is all capitalized, it means that uh, the, the writer is using the personal name of God. Not the generic name, but the personal name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah. And in this Psalm, every time the word Lord appears, it's capitalized. So David is talking specifically about Yahweh, the God of Israel. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. And there's that word Anton led us through a few moments ago. Just to pause, lift up the name of the God of Jacob. Verse 7, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. The psalm writer here asks three questions. He asks, who is the King of glory? Who can approach the King of glory? And when or how will the King of glory come? First, who is the King of glory? Well, when one of our boys uh, was very young, he developed a fascination with whales. I think it all began with the movie Free Willy. Anybody remember that movie? I watched that movie like 2,000 times, I think. (laughs) That's where it started, but he loved whales. By the time he was four or five years old, he could rattle off the name of a dozen or more whales. You know, blue whales and sperm whales and humpback whales, beluga, narwhal, he would go through the whole list but he had a collection of little toy whales that he could play with. But killer whales, orcas, were his favorite. So eventually we decided to take a family trip to SeaWorld. In those days, there was a SeaWorld near Cleveland, of all places. So we went to to, uh, SeaWorld so he could see a real killer whale, Shamu, who lived at that SeaWorld. So we got to the park, and we went straight to the big uh, holding tank where they kept Uh, Shamu the killer whale before the show started and they're not doing these shows anymore but we walked I picked him up so we could look over the edge of this tank to see his first real live killer whale in person and as I picked him up he his eyes got real big and he whispered to me in this little awestruck voice he said daddy it's really big I thought that was cute, but it also dawned on me that, of course, it was big to him because his whole idea, his whole image of a killer whale had been learned from little toys about this big and from books and from a TV screen. So, of course, his idea of a killer whale, his image of a killer whale was too small. And I think we're off in the same way when it comes to how we think about God. The psalm reminds us that God is always bigger always greater, always more awesome than we think or imagine. And that's why when we see and look at the Milky Way or the Grand Canyon or Shamu and we think it's really big, we also have a thought inside that the one who made this, the one who dreamed this up and created it must be really, really big. Two things that we see here about the king of glory. First, the king of glory is the creator. Verse one, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The earth is the Lord's, the psalmist says. Now, most of us hear those words and we 
You know, we nod in agreement. Yeah, sure, sure, God is the creator. Whole Bible begins with the words, in the beginning God created. God spoke and everything that is came to be. He created everything through the power of his word. But we look a little deeper, there's something interesting here. I mentioned that the word Lord is in all caps. David is using God's personal name here. The name God gave to Moses back in Exodus. And this is significant. And it's significant because in the ancient world of Israel, uh, the surrounding people groups and cultures all had their own gods, small g, or God. The Canaanites, for example, had a god they called Baal, the god of fertility, often depicted as a man with the head of a bull. The Philistines had a god they called Dagon, who had the body of a fish with a human head and human hands. The Moabites had a fearsome god called Chemosh, the destroyer a God of war to whom they may have offered human sacrifices. So when David writes, the earth is Yahweh's, Jehovah's, he's saying there is only one creator God. He he distinguishes Yahweh from all the other gods around. Yahweh alone is the creator. Now, this may seem to us something that comes out of a, a distant past and a very different kind of foreign ancient time, but... I think it's very relevant in our world today. Now, we don't have stone idols with exotic names, but our culture has largely removed Yahweh, the God of Jacob, the God of the Bible, from the discussion of the created cosmos. He's no longer part of the discussion. We have gods named science or wealth or technology or politics or the universe or even the self. Talk more about that later. So the psalm here is affirming that there is a God who has a name and he created all things. Secondly, everything and everyone therefore belongs to him. The earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell within. He's saying everything, the earth and all who live upon it belong not to Baal, not to Dagon, not to Chemosh, or any other gods of the ancient world, but to one God, Yahweh, who created all things. So who is the king of glory? His name is Yahweh, Jehovah, the creator of all that is, and everything, the earth, and everything, and every person who lives on the earth belongs to him. That's the king of glory. But secondly, there's a question that follows right after. Who can approach this king of glory? Who can approach the king of glory? One summer, uh, while I was in college, my father helped me get a a job with a guy in our church who uh, owned um, an electrical business, and he had a lot of electricians working for him, so he got me a job as an apprentice to an electrician, uh, that's what they called it, but I was really just kind of a gopher. I would get his tools and stuff like that because I knew, I knew nothing about electricity. Uh, one of the first days on the job, however, uh, this experienced electrician was up on a ladder, leaned up against the side of a, of a larger building in the middle of a project. He had wires coming out of the building and all that, and he hollered down to me, hey, go get something. I forget what he had me get. Get something out of my truck. I turned around to go to his truck, and as I was going toward the truck, I heard this popping sound and kind of a cry And I turned around, and the electrician was lying on the ground, sort of writhing around with blood coming out of his mouth. I ran over. What happened? What happened? He said, well, that's what I get from working too fast. He had grabbed the wrong wires, and it blew him off the ladder, and he bit his tongue almost in two. It was terrifying. Terrifying to me, especially. And since that time, I've had this kind of great respect and fear of electricity, because I've seen what it can do. I mean, if I have to change a light bulb at home, and you can ask my wife, I go down to the basement, turn off the circuit breakers, <laughs> and then I'm like, <laughs> waiting for that to happen. Now, I understand that I shouldn't approach electricity frivolously or carelessly, because it's powerful. Now, electricity isn't bad, it's not mean, it doesn't hate me, it's very good, but it's powerful. You approach electricity on its terms, not on your own terms. Now, it's not a perfect analogy, but it speaks a bit to us of the holiness of God. 
Verse three, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Now David here is talking about the holiness of God, Yahweh. He's thinking about the Ark of the Covenant, I think. He's thinking about Uzzah, this man who reached out, <coughs> excuse me, and touched the Ark in violation of God's instructions and died. I think he's thinking about two brothers named Nadab and Abihu from Leviticus chapter 10. They were sons of Aaron, nephews of Moses, who the Bible says offered strange fire to the Lord. That is, they, they approached God frivolously rather than by his careful instructions and they were consumed by the holiness of God. Who shall stand in his holy place? Who is qualified to approach the king of glory? And David mentions four requirements. He says, he who has clean hands. That refers to outward deeds and actions. Jewish ritual law eventually turned this into a literal washing of the hands before worship. It means to have innocent hands. Secondly, he says a pure heart. This refers to inner motives and intentions. It means having a clear and transparent heart before God, doing the right things for the right reasons. Let me pause right there after just two requirements. Here's what I noticed. David here is saying that what qualifies someone to approach the God who is holy is not being a pretty good person. That's the answer in our culture, isn't it? You know, if we said, what would allow you to come before God? What, what entitles you to come before God or to get into his heaven? People say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I haven't killed anybody. That's always the next line. I'm not really sure why. <laughs> but standards much, much higher, David says. Clean hands, pure heart. Right about now, you should be thinking somewhere inside your mind, this is, this is gonna be a problem. It's gonna be a little bit of a problem. The third thing, does not lift his soul to what is false. This is the question of worship and devotion. In David's context, it refers to the pagan gods of the surrounding cultures. In our world, it might be offering uh, our devotion, our greatest care to that which is not God, to money or to work or to status. Fourthly, who does not swear deceitfully. That is one who is true to his neighbor and true before God. Now, modern culture has made a dramatic shift with regard to truth, the whole idea of truth. For centuries, maybe for most of human existence, people have understood truth to have a transcendent source. That is, truth, capital T, comes to us from the outside of us. In the biblical worldview, it comes from the transcendent God who communicates his truth to us through his word, and then we orient our lives and our thinking toward that truth, and we conform to the truth that comes to us from outside. No longer is that the case in our culture. Modern culture has flipped this about. It took hundreds of years to get here, but our culture now understands truth to originate where? In the self. How often do you hear, hey, you be you. Speak your own truth. We now think truth it begins in ourselves and we expect the world around us to conform to our truth. Isn't that right? Isn't that what, we, what we're seeing happen? The oldest lie in the Bible, book of Genesis, is when the serpent tempts Adam and Eve by saying, you can be like God. In other words, you can determine truth for yourself. The serpent still whispers that same lie in our culture in a thousand ways. So who can approach the king of glory? One who has innocent hands, one who has pure motives, one who not, does, not, does not offer devotion to that which is not God, one who is not captive to the winds of culture. And here's the problem. We want to have clean hands, but we don't have clean hands. We want to have pure hearts, but we don't have pure hearts. In small ways and in big ways, we have lifted up our hearts to that which is not God. Therefore, the answer to the question, who can approach the king of glory, is no one. No one. 
Psalm 14 we read, they have all turned aside, together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. So how are our hands made clean again? How are our hearts made pure enough to approach the God who is holy, the King of glory? And this is the great story of the Bible. In fact, Psalm 24 tells in poetic form the entire story arc of the Bible. It begins with creation and ends with the coming of the King of Glory, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Way back in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest of the people would enter the most holy place, offer a blood sacrifice of an animal to atone for the sins of the people. And that sacrifice was offered over and over and over again. But the New Testament tells us that Jesus did this once for all. Hebrews chapter 9. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctifies them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so we may serve the living God? Bible saying that through Jesus, we see that the king of glory, who is holy, who is the creator, is also the king who redeems, forgives. Hebrews 10, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. So by the blood of Jesus, we can be made clean. By the resurrection of Jesus, we are made new. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And this is the good news of the gospel that we proclaim here week after week, that through Christ, we are made holy. Through Christ, we are made clean. We are made new. So those are the first two questions. Who is the king of glory? Who can approach the king of glory? But there's a third question. When or how will the king of glory come? When or how will the king of glory come? Verse seven. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Selah. Now notice here, uh, David's perspective shifts a bit. He's no longer talking about us, human beings, entering the holy place of God, the holy presence of God, Yahweh. He's talking rather about that holy God coming to us, coming into our space where we live. The pictures of a victorious king and mighty king returning from battle. Notice the imagery, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. In the ancient world, a king did not send troops out to fight a battle, as in our world. In the ancient world, the king led troops into battle. So the king of glory has won a great victory. He's defeated the enemy and he's approaching the city. The song is calling people to be prepared to welcome their conquering king. So what's this all about? I said before, this is a messianic psalm. It's pointing us to the day when the Messiah, the Savior, would come into the city and be their king. The ancient psalm is pointing us toward Jesus, the promised and coming king of glory. And the Bible tells us he comes in four ways. First, obviously, his miraculous birth in Bethlehem. The Magi came from the east, proclaiming him to be the newborn king. Remember, the shepherds were terrified at what? At the glory of the Lord that shone around them. The king was born. Secondly, the Bible says he came 30-some years later in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The Gospels tell us that on the day we call Palm Sunday, that we'll remember again in a few weeks when we get back into the Gospel of Mark next weekend, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to symbolize he was coming as their king. People spread their cloaks on the ground, waved the palm branches, shouting and singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes into the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of our father David. Jesus came as king, 
but as a king who would serve, as a king who would give himself, he came as the final sacrifice by which we are made clean. Thirdly, and this is a coming yet to come, he will come at the promised second coming. The great book of Revelation tells us in Revelation 19, John the Apostle writes, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus, our King, came the first time in great humility to offer his life as a sacrifice, but the next time he comes as the conquering King to judge and to rule. But there's a fourth way he comes, and that is finally he comes to us, personally. Revelation chapter three, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Okay, let's try to put this all together. So who is the king of glory? The king of glory is God, Yahweh, the holy one, the creator of all things. And as Christians, we understand that that God became flesh. And that is Jesus, the God who is with us, Jesus who is the king of glory. And who can approach the king of glory? Who can approach with clean hands and a pure heart? No one. But the good news is that even though we cannot approach him, he has come to us. So when and how will the king of glory come? He was born in Bethlehem, rode into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago to offer himself as the king who suffers. He will come again as the king of kings to rule and to judge. And he comes to us today, scripture says, by his spirit to knock on the doors of our hearts. Now, there are two things here as we wrap up. Notice, Jesus comes not as a kind of consultant into our lives. He comes not as a life coach, uh, not as a kind of magical genie to give us our best life now. He comes to us as the king of glory, the king of glory. And here's the thing about kings. They have authority. They have power, and they want everything. See, our whole nation was begun in resistance to a king who wanted everything, right? That's, that's our national story, and we resist kings. We resist authority, but make, make no mistake. Jesus is king, and he wants everything, and he owns everything. And here's the problem. We also want everything, don't we? I want everything. I want to be my own king. And so do you. You want your own kingdom. And so we resist his rule. We resist his authority. But he is the king who loves us completely. He is the king who poured out his own blood to make our hands and our hearts clean. He's the king who can be trusted, but he's the king who knocks. Second thing I want to say is that our our hearts, the hearts of our, the, the center of our lives, we have doors, gates. There's a doorway to your heart, and the doorknob is on your side. It's just how God made us. We must decide to open the gates, open the door. We must welcome the king. We must surrender to him as king. We must worship him as king. We must serve him as king. And here's the question I want to leave you with. Do you want him as your king or do you want him to just take a small place in your kingdom? Do you want him as king or do you want him to just take up a little small plot in your kingdom? See, it's quite possible for us to be here today. It's quite possible to be here in church in a place of worship. It's quite possible to believe 
everything I've said today. It's quite possible to acknowledge the king of glory without ever opening that door, without ever surrendering to that king. Something in you resists that rule. You hold something back. And when you resist his rule, you resist his love. Know this, the king is good. The king is good, and he wants good for you. So lift up your heads, the psalm says. Lift up your heads and open the gates that he may come in. Why don't you bow with me as we close today? Lord, how we thank you today for your word. We thank you for this, these ancient psalms we've been in for five weeks now. Ancient words that are so contemporary. Thank you for allowing and even inviting us to come to you with questions, even hard questions. Teach us to be honest about our questions and even our doubts. Teach us to keep asking, to keep searching, to keep searching your word until you reveal yourself to us. And when we see your glory, when we see your truth, when we see your goodness and grace, may we lift up our heads, throw open the gates, and invite you to come in. It's in your name that we pray.